Hi, this is Mick Burgess. I'm now backstage at the O2 Academy in Newcastle and I'm joined today by Darren Wharton from there. Darren, how are you doing? Hi, Mick. Nice to see you. Great to see you. I mean, you're part way through your current UK tour. How are the shows going so far? Going wonderfully, yeah. We're having a great time. Um, we've had a great response in London and a great response in uh, Norwich mm-hmm. and Glasgow last night mm-hmm. and then Newcastle tonight. Glasgow's so, a lively place. Great. You know, <laughs> I was surprised because usually London can be a bit difficult, you know, it's mm. notorious for having a quiet crowd in London, but we had a fantastic night there last week in, on, on Friday in, on Shepherd's Bush. Mm. So, yeah, really, really pleased. Like the stars that shine high above me, all the beauty we found. What about the set that you're putting together, are, are you covering stuff from right across your career? We are, we, 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 we're sort of focusing on um, uh, the last album and uh, and, the, and obviously the new recording of Out of the Silence, so we, I mean, but we always do songs from Out of the Silence anyway, that's, yeah. one of, that's one of the reasons we re-recorded it, <laughs> because we're getting new fans all the time and really, you know, it just didn't seem fair, we we're going out playing songs from Out of the Silence and the only version of that was a 30 year old album yeah. that, that belongs to a giant label that doesn't care about Dare, doesn't care about Dare fans, doesn't care about anything that we do. So it just didn't seem right that we're going out promoting an old album that we don't get anything from. So we've recorded a nice fresh version and um, it's we're proud of it and it, and now we can go out and promote the album with a clean conscience, you know. Yeah, so, so it's been locked away in a, a label's vault somewhere. Yeah, and, it's, and they just don't care. Yeah. About it. They don't, they, they are not, they're not interested in Dare, they're not interested in the fans, they're not interested in anything. So now we've got our own version we can promote the hell out of it and yeah. and it's great for the fans we dedicated it to our fans anyway so we're just happy the way it's turned out so it's great it's 30 years incredibly young. i just realized that it doesn't seem like 30 years to me when it's no. to me it still seems like quite a, yeah. a new album so <laughs> it does to me. It does to me. Yeah. I've got the. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've got the scars. <laughs> no, no. So, I mean, you know. I mean, it, I mean, time flies, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Life flies, and we all, you know, it does doesn't seem that long ago. But I mean, obviously, it is. So. So how was the recording process? Was it was it easy to record the second time? No, around? it wasn't because we decided to try and keep it as authentic to the mm. original as we could. Uh, I wanted to sort of change it more, but Vinnie kept saying, oh, "Let's keep." bit like the original you know um, and for that reason we didn't put any b-sides on there and because we wanted it to be the new version of our silence yeah and we felt that if we would have put b-sides on it and bonus tracks it wouldn't be the same album yeah because people like to put albums on a shuffle and you know if I put if I bought a, a version of Toto 4 and it had all these different tracks on it it wouldn't be Toto 4 would it? yeah you know? I, think, I think Van Halen said that, that when they did their issues you know you, you've got Van Halen 1 you know what the songs are yeah you know what the songs are you know what you're mm-hmm. expecting you know we just start putting bonus this and bonus that on it you know? was, there, was there any songs that you'd sort of hadn't played for years and years it was a little bit tricky to remember how to how to do them all of them <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I mean, we yeah. play Abandon all the time, and we play yeah. Into the Fire all the time, yeah. and we play the Rain Dance, King of Spades, obviously. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was, but we did try to stay authentic to the original, so we, yeah. we put in a sort of, and Vinny, you know, Vinny talked me into it because we, we, you know, going back to Toto again, if, if, I, if, I, if I listen to a reissue of, say, Africa, hmm. let's say they re recorded that and they didn't put this, that great keyboard solo in it. Yeah. Diddle, 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 oh, sorry, Rosanna, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Diddle, 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 if that wasn't in it, I'd go, ah, because I love that <laughs> solo. Yeah, you yeah. Know. So, so, you know, so we've kept it faithful to the tracks that it was. Yeah. When you first um, released Out of the Silence back in '88, it'd been sort of five years since you'd um, since Thin Lizzy had folded. Yeah. So what, what have you been doing in those individuals? Because I know you work with Phil in his well, you in know, solo capacity. Yeah, I mean it, it was difficult, you know, because I've sort of found myself out of work and and but I didn't. It didn't occur. To, it, did, it didn't. I didn't feel like that at the time. It just felt like I had a new start that I had to, you know, follow follow my dreams and, and do something unique, you know, and different. 
and uh, obviously I'd been writing with Phil so I'd got a bit of experience with that but I didn't really consider myself as a singer in those days mm. but so that was a that was a big learning curve you know and that's another reason why I like to re you know why I ever wanted to record out sounds because you know vocally now I, I, I sort of know what I'm doing yeah I didn't really know what I was doing then. it was all on a wing and a prayer you know uh, so I do consider myself a much better vocalist now yeah. uh, and I think most people would agree with that anyway so that's another reason we did it you know mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah I mean it was a learning curve writing songs starting to become a, a front man and you know it's a, it's, a, it's a hell of a thing to do The follow up album um, The Blood From A Stone was two, came three years later and it was it was a much heavier album. Was, it, was that a reaction to the sort of music well, at that time? To be brutally honest, the record company, what happened is we, we put out Out of the Silence and just as we put out Out of the Silence, Guns N' Roses broke. Mm. And all bands were, every, every band and their auntie and their uncles became heavy metal bands, you know. Mm. And subsequently, the label turned around and said to us, we want a heavier album. Now what we should have done in hindsight is stick to our guns but we didn't we were pressured into recording a heavy album um, and even the press when we put out of the silence you know a lot of people a lot of people said oh it's too many keyboards too much this oh you know, yeah you know yeah. not heavy enough you know so combined with the record company and the press saying they're not heavy enough we're not interested we jumped on the bandwagon and, and basically said, right, we'll show them how to write a heavy album. And that's what we did. And I think it was a mistake. It did work, though. It's a, I'm very proud of the album. Mm -hmm. if, if we re-recorded it again, I would, I would certainly sing it better. <laughs> I'm not particularly proud of my vocals on it. I just think it's a bit scratchy, you know. Mm -hmm. If it was David Coverdale singing it, I think it'd be brilliant. The thing is, it was like after Blood from Stone and that mistake, because after a couple of years later, I realised that we did the right, the wrong thing, and um, not the wrong thing, but for the wrong reasons. You know, morally, we should have principles. We should have stayed to our guns more than we did. Instead of just going, yeah, okay, we'll do what you want. You know, that was wrong. You know, I hit a few hard times and we lost the deal, so I was sort of out of out of a record contract. I was still working, at writing songs, um, and then we got an offer from a German label to do. I did some demos, Can for the Storm, mm -hmm. and German label got hold of that MTM and offered us a deal, and that sort of relaunched the band really. Yeah. And then after that, I formed my own label uh, and wrote Belief. You know, and that was a turning point for me because. I set out the reason the album's core belief is because I wanted to just do everything from the heart. It was great, you know, there we're back. You know, and that was because I'd stuck to my guns, you know. And then subsequently, you know, we did Beneath the Shining Water, another very successful album, and I love that album, you know, some lovely songs on it. And then, you know, and then from that point, We've just said from now on, we just we do what feels right from the heart, you know. King of Spades off that album is a real standout, and that's, that was your tribute to, to, to Phil. Phil. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, to what, what, what did Phil mean to you as a, as a friend and as a well, you know, a he was a wonderful guy, you know, and, and a great friend, and, uh, and a lot of people always ask me, well, isn't that a bit disrespectful to King of Spades? And it isn't, because... The, the idea of the song came from, uh, I think the album was Fighting. If you look at the Fighting cover, Scott Gorham, they've all got a pit, page of Robbo, Scott, Brian Downey and Phil. And Brian Downey's got a club, ah. Scott mm -hmm. Gorham's got a heart, mm -hmm. Robbo's got a diamond and Phil's got a spade. Mm. So that was where the that was where yeah. the idea came from for the song. Um, just from the fact that they, he'd, he'd called himself the spade on the album anyway. Yeah.
just a couple of um, uh, questions on Thin Lizzy, obviously, um, just b- before we wrap up. I mean, you were 17 years old when you joined just, there. Just past 17. Yeah, just 18. How on earth did you end up joining a band like Thin Lizzy, who had been on you know, roadways yeah, for so Yeah, I mean, long? you know, I mean, I was very lucky. Right place, right time. Mm-hmm. Um, I, was, uh, I was playing in a club in Manchester, and... Uh, one of Phil's mates used to come in and see me. I was actually playing with a, with a Bill Tarmy who used to be Jack Duckworth yes, in Coronation yes, Street. Yeah. yeah. Oh, because he's a singer as well. Yeah, he was yeah. a great singer. Yeah. <laughs> so I was on grand piano. And Bill was the compere singing, you know. And uh, so we were good friends. And uh, and there's a guy called Joe used to come in. As Joe Leach used to come in and see his play. He was one of the Quality Street gang, a bit of a gangster, really. And he knew Phil and the lads. And obviously, what happened is Gary Moore had left halfway through an American tour. Yeah, yeah. They were stuck, so they brought Midge Orr in, mm-hmm. who couldn't really play guitar. I don't, I'm sure Midge won't mind me saying that. He's not really a guitarist. Well, not for Lizzie standard, anyway. Yeah. Uh, so Midge also doubled up on a bit of keyboards. It was Dave Flett as well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And then Phil really liked the texture of the keyboards. He mm-hmm. thought it added something. Mm-hmm. So when Midge went off and joined Ultra Rock, Phil decided he wanted to get a keyboard player. Mm-hmm. To add different, because Phil was always trying to try different things, you know, and he was always, he never liked to just sit, and he, he never wanted to stagnate, so he'd like to do other things, you know. Yeah. So, and and Joe just came in one night, and he'd obviously seen Phil, and, and he said, "Oh, uh, how would you like to have an audition with the Thin Lizzy?" I went, "Well, I was 17 then." I went, "Absolutely." So two days later, he took me down to London, um, where I met Phil and Scott in Good Earth Studios while they were doing Chinatown. Mm-hmm. And Phil just asked me to do one line, you know, and it was a Chinatown riff, and it's in A minor, and it's like, and it's such an easy riff on a keyboard, you know, I can play it blindfolded, you know, and I played it first time, and they all went, wow, you're in. And then Phil said, who do you support? I said, Manchester United, he went, you're in. That was it. <laughs> Just why I didn't say Sunderland then. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I was, uh, I was, I got in and it was, that was uh, me and Scott. Scott took us to the pub, got drunk, got re- got on really well with Scott. We've been best friends ever since. Yeah. Got on really well with Phil. And the, first of all, they put me in a hotel. They put me in the Cunard Hotel in London. And uh, I was there for about two weeks. And then Phil moved me into his house with Q in Q, mm-hmm. with me, Phil, and the Caroline, the girls, and, and Gus, their driver. And, and then I was part of the family. It was it. Yeah. It was great. You know, Phil is an established songwriter. Did you feel a bit sort of daunted, sort of oh, pitching yeah. ideas to him? Yeah, very sort of at my depth, yeah. But, you know, Phil was very good at making people feel welcome. Mm. And, um, you know, and well, not welcome, but he was good at getting the best out of people. So, yeah, yeah I, I felt very honoured that I could even sit, that, sit down and write with him, you know. So with John coming in, it meant you were no longer the new boy in Thin Lizzy as well, so... Oh, yeah, yeah, I know, so yeah, John. Did, carry in, yeah. did he have to carry your bags for you? <laughs> we, we had him making tea for a couple of weeks. <laughs> no. Because I think with Thunder and Lightning, you were even more involved, you know, you did four, four of the nine songs, and, you know, this is the one, Summer's Going Down, in particular, the two standout tracks off the album. Yeah. I mean, how was the process of recording and, and writing that album, sort of... It was a bit wild. Um, it was a little crazy, you know. <laughs> Phil was getting into one of the... You know, so I was getting a bit tired and you know we were starting we were getting into the studio later and later and it was one of those albums where it started you know where you get Scott and me being at the studio from mm. say 3 o'clock in the afternoon and Phil would be turning up about 9 or 10 o'clock at night yeah. so in that respect it was it was a bit it was a little strange and uh, there was a few nerves getting a bit shredded you know um, it doesn't come across in the music though no and no I mean, but having said that you know it was it was a great experience, you know. We, we, we it was just a great experience. So we got there in the end, you know, and we had a lot of fun making it, you know. Looking forward, I mean, it's been a couple of years since your last studio album of new material. Yeah. Have you started working on any yes, new material? Yes. Yeah. New yeah. album coming out next month, next year. All yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So any titles or anything you can reveal? Not really. I mean, I wouldn't like to say because I've done <laughs> that in the past. <laughs> this, this. 
after this tour finishes? What, what are you doing next? Are you, are you going to be working on the new album? Are you working on the new album now. So, yeah. we, 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 you know, Out the Silence is done and out the way, which we're happy about. And uh, that comes out on the 29th. Yeah. And then the new album will be out next year. A yeah. uh, full new studio album. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm aiming towards now. It's a lot to look forward to. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Darren, yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure. Nice to meet you, mate. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Nice to meet you, Darren. And she stayed.